we would play in bars for, you know, 10 people uh, on Wednesday nights for like basically no money. And then like kind of did that for uh, almost a year, but it was, it was a great learning experience because you kind of know like, okay, what do I have to do to get these 10 people dancing? thought that it would go nowhere and it would be a one-time thing but the thing blew up I don't know how we got the right DJs to play that night and the word got around Montreal was dead that weekend maybe and it just blew up the guy next to me is like yo dude just text her whatever random words you want and she'll stop tex texting you so I started texting her black tiger sex machine <laughs> and I don't know why we were playing soccer that night Pat Mark and myself and I'm like dudes like this name for some reason it sounds good black tiger sex machine at one point just when we were when I was going to see Mark and then Julian would start coming over and then we just kind of all decided at one point when Mark came back to Montreal oh let's let's start doing parties together and events together in Montreal and that's kind of when black tiger sex machine uh, came about Hey guys, so it's the first time I'm doing this sort of intro, but I wanted to do this because I wanted just to kind of explain to you what's going to happen uh, in the Black Tiger Sex Machine interview. I'm going to have Patrick talk about the origins, and then I'm going to have Mark talk about how they got themselves out there and the record label, and then I'm going to have Julian to talk about the branding, marketing, all of that. Uh, so hope you guys enjoy this. This is, I think, my new approach to interviewing trios and splitting it up, but have a streamlined storyline throughout so you guys can know and learn exactly about uh, the trio, uh, Black Tiger Sex Machine and everything. So hope you guys enjoy. Hi, this is Lauren Engel of Sidewalk Talk. Today I'm with Patrick of <laughs> Black Tiger Sex Machine. Yes, hello. <laughs> Early on, you were already really into music, right? You were doing violin and stuff for so many years. Uh, yeah, so when I was six years old, I started taking violin lessons. My mom wanted me to learn an instrument, and I kind of randomly picked uh, violin. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure why. My sister was doing piano, so I guess I didn't want to do the same thing she was doing. Um, just, I guess, kind of a competitive thing, maybe. So yeah, I, I did violin lessons for um, all through elementary school and then high school and then uh, kind of like stopped when I was around 18 just because I kind of wanted to take a break from music and uh, but at the same time I, I, I started really getting into electronic music when I was around 18, 19, 20 and uh, starting to go out uh, to shows and clubs and like even when I was a bit younger you know I was really into hip-hop and like I was like oh it would be cool to become a DJ of course back then it was more kind of scratching and everything but never ended up really doing any scratching but uh, yeah so around 1920 we were like really into uh, justice and acts like uh, boys noise and Daft Punk and really uh, in Montreal, where we're from, electronic music was really kind of uh, blowing up, I guess. I mean, it's always been big there, kind of, I think, uh, bigger than in other parts of North America. Like, there was a big um, disco scene in the 70s and uh, a lot of disco music coming from Montreal. And then, uh, like, in the early 90s, there was a big rave scene and uh, house scene before it kind of got established in other parts. I mean, U.S. It was always kind of big in Detroit, Chicago, New York, I guess. But, you know, I think in Kansas, they didn't really have any, rave, <laughs> like, any yeah. house scene in 1992. Maybe they did. I don't know. But anyway, so Montreal's kind of always been, I guess, um, kind of ahead of the curve music-wise. Um, and then, yeah, so back in 2007, um, all those acts were really popular in Montreal and we kind of just looked at that and thought, you know, this is really fun, we love it, we love kind of going to shows and we want to, we just want to do that, you know, it was kind mm -hmm. of like a, a crazy dream. Actually, how did you find their music initially? Like even Bloody Beatrice, right, you were listening? Yeah, um, me actually, the first, it was one of my friends, uh, one of our friends, 
um, from uh, from high school. Well, technically, we have this weird thing in Quebec called CJEP, which is kind of like between high school and university. So you're like kind of like mm -hmm. a middle state, a bit of freedom and like you know whatever, but it's not exactly university. But anyway, that's not important. So one of my friends from there, he he kind of introduced me. Uh, to a lot of the acts like Bloody Beat Roots, he was always kind of showing me this cool stuff. And then, like, I just started going through all the blogs and like downloading all the music I could. And then, um, Mark at the time, uh, he was going to school in, uh, in a few hours away, uh, in Ontario. And he, it's a very kind of little college town where he lives with a lot of student parties. So, he was doing keg parties and, and you know big parties at his house where he lived with eight other guys, and then he started just kind of DJing there and DJing in the in the college bars there, and I would go to visit him and then he would kind of show me how to DJ and we started doing his house parties basically. So we just started, you know, we would play all the mainstream stuff at the time, but then we would try to throw in, you know, some kind of remixes or mashups with the stuff we liked which a lot of the crowd at the time you know they didn't really get and especially in a town like that which was a very kind of college town you know I remember if some people they would get mad if you played oh. like any electronic stuff any house music and then I mean oddly enough what, what really kind of broke it in, in a place like that and I really saw it evolve with stuff like uh, the early Avicii and mm. like Black Eyed Peas and Akon and Black David Guetta. So <laughs> like, you know, a lot of people, they, they have this kind of negative view of, of those acts, but I kind of always give them credit because I think they really brought that sound to the mainstream North American audience. But you guys met in high school, right? Or was it early, even earlier on, right? When have you guys met, like? Yeah, so we, we met, um, Mark and I have known each other since kindergarten, actually. Yeah. Uh, so a long time. And uh, we weren't friends initially, but like, in, yeah, he kind of, we were enemies at one point. <laughs> But, oh my god! Yeah, then then like uh, end of grade school and like high school, we became really uh, close friends, and like we live in the same neighborhood, so we would always hang out together with a, a few other guys that we're all still friends with. And then Julian, um, we met him. He went to the same high school as us, so we became friends with him uh, a few years later. But he also grew up in the same neighborhood, and we've yeah, we've all been friends for a very long time now and kind of just you know grew up started getting into the same music and everything and uh you know yeah at one point just when we were when i was going to see mark and then julian would start coming over and then we just kind of all decided at one point when mark came back to montreal oh let's let's start doing parties together and events together in montreal and that's kind of when Black Tiger Sex Machine uh, came about. Mm -hmm. And then, but were you guys putting out your own music before that? Um, yeah, so when we started doing small parties, of course, like straight away we wanted to do our own productions. Oh, I meant like separately, like were you, oh, you have a solo project? No, 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 not, not at all. Like I would kind of tinker with programs and do little hip-hop beats and stuff. Oh wow, so the first project took seriously already like... <laughs> yes. Uh, it was so successful. So yeah, the first one, I mean it, it took a long time, like there was a few years, you know, we were just playing, you know, the first year uh, we were DJing in Montreal when actually Mark was kind of, it was his last year in Ontario, so we would go there, then come back in Montreal, do little events there. We would play in bars for you know, 10 people uh, on Wednesday nights for like basically no money. And then like kind of did that for uh, almost a year, but it was it was a great learning experience because you kind of know like, okay, what do I have to do to get these 10 people dancing, you know, and, and really kind of reading the crowd. Because when you have like so few people, you can see yeah. the reaction to <laughs> anything. And then like, you'll have 10 people dancing and then you put on like the wrong track and oh. then just they all go to the bar and you, know, you got an empty dance floor. <laughs> so yeah, so you know, 
started doing those little events and then we would get you know from time to time like something bigger like a hundred people and we would you know be super happy with that and um, so we played at this small place for almost a year it closed then we got like another weekly event at another uh, bar in Montreal called Saint Officiel uh, which um, it was a really cool little spot you know it was it was uh, you know, very popular like on the weekends, but we would play there on the um, Tuesday nights. So that was like their smallest nights, mm -hmm. basic, basically. So <laughs> still kind of just kept grinding and, and putting our name out there and started doing events with other uh, DJs or acts or whoever we could collab with in Montreal to, you know, go play their night at their weekly party at another bar and they would come do our night as a guest and, and then just started building our name in kind of the local scene. And then after a year of playing at that event um, and doing some other parties with other acts in Montreal, like I guess our first kind of major thing in Montreal was uh, uh, this venue called Belmont in Montreal, which is uh, a great venue. A lot of acts come through it. It's kind of like smaller, but still kind of sizable, like 600 people. And uh, they always have interesting acts come through. And the, the owner and the manager, uh, Alessandro and Brooke, they, they came to see us and they're like, oh, we would like to do like a, some kind of weekly or monthly event with you guys. We see what you've been doing. We think, you know, you could do something really cool in a bigger space. Uh, so let's work on a concept and launch it in a couple months. But by the way, we have an open night next Friday. Can you guys put together a party in a week? And we're like, whoa, we don't know if we can do it. You know, we, we during events, our biggest ones are like a hundred and something people and you want us to fill this big venue. So we just kind of put together a concept of uh, like, Jillian was like, oh, let's do like some kind of costume or, or theme or whatever. And we thought of, like cannibals, <laughs> I don't know why. And then uh, Mark found like the the poster of this movie called uh, the Cannibal End Holocaust or something <laughs> online. And we kind of took the poster of the movie, adapted it, and like, okay, we're doing a cannibal themed party in a week <laughs> called Cannibal End. And um, you know, had like six days to promote it, and then just people like a few hundred people showed up and like they were all dressed up and it, we were like whoa what the hell happened like yeah. we just put together a party and it's like three times the amount of people uh, that we've ever had and we did it with a few other acts in Montreal um, and everyone kind of had like such a great time and it was such a good experience we're like okay we have to do this again so we started doing it every month and it really got big in Montreal and it was uh, you know, it was kind of multiple styles, but everyone basically wanted to play just the most intense stuff possible. And it was kind of before uh, dubstep would kind of come mm. on to dominate everything. So it was kind of more of a mix of electro, of uh, dubstep, of whatever kind of would get popular at the time, you know, Moombaton or <laughs> all these kind of sub -jars that came up. But as long as it was kind of intense and really um, everyone every act just basically wanted to make the crowd go as hard as possible so the nights would always be really wild we would have crazy mosh pits and, and crowd surfing and whatever so how do you describe how your personal personalities like feed off each other and then also like is there I know Julian does more of the branding but uh -huh. how, do you, how did you like figure out the skills of how to make you guys what you are um, I mean, I guess it kind of just naturally came about. We've, we've all knew each other from before, mm -hmm. um, so we kind of have a good team vibe, I guess, mm -hmm. and uh, a, a good friendship. And I think a lot of acts sometimes, you know, they, they have trouble with that. If you work with friends, then mm -hmm. it can get weird sometimes. But we've always kind of had a, a common goal to go as far as we can in the music industry, which has kind of kept us together. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, to come back to like the individual strengths, I guess, I mean, for me, you know, like working, uh, doing music when I was young and really kind of getting into the production slowly when I was 
when we were just starting out. So I, I've always been kind of very focused on um, just the, the music and like the songwriting and trying to create cool stuff uh, sonically. And then, um, you know, the other guys like Mark, he was the first one to get into DJing. So he's always oh, okay. been very focused on the, the live aspect. And so programming the live show, uh, you know, looking for all the the tracks from new upcoming producers and uh you know trying to see you know what's what's the cool stuff that's coming out let's let's contact this artist who has 2000 followers on SoundCloud and get his music and whatever and um Julian he's like the you know like he's very kind of detailed oriented on kind of everything so when it comes to like you know, branding, obviously you have to be very kind of detailed oriented yeah. to make sure everything fits together. And also that kind of same mentality is applied to the music as well. So he's, uh, he's very kind of uh, into, you know, all the, a lot of the mixing and mastering and all the making sure everything sounds kind of as strong as possible and as, as uh, heavy as possible that we can make it. And then obviously everyone kind of uh, jumps in on whatever, whatever, you know, it's not like we have totally separate jobs and you don't touch what someone else is doing. So uh, a lot of the composing, it's like a team effort, you know, uh, Julian will send me an idea or a baseline and I'll hop on it, you know, compose like a, a break or whatever, or get this send it back to him he'll kind of work on the sound and kind of bring everything together and then we'll just kind of bounce back and and then you know or i'll work on something create a song send it to them they'll, they'll have their input add some stuff so we we try to we obviously have our strengths and weaknesses but we try to um, you know make sure everything kind of is, is a team effort and because I mean at the end of the day you just want everything to be as strong as possible you know and uh, uh, yeah so yeah. We're, we're always trying to make sure that what, if, whether it's music or concerts or branding or you know just talking to fans and you know the like uh, building a community and interacting with them uh, we just try to push it you know as far as we can mm -hmm. I love that thank you so much you're welcome <laughs> hi and now I'm with Mark <laughs> hello I'm Mark of Black Tiger 6 machine yes <laughs> what kind of family did you grow up in like was it a musical family or no not at all my family yeah. was really into business and I was only about sports and video game until I quit varsity basketball because I was at the end of the bench never getting a minute. <laughs> so after two years, uh, I stopped and then I, that was the beginning of the blog era. So I was going to probably like 25, 30 blogs on downloading every song, discovering group like Justice, Bloody Be Truths, uh, Boys Noise. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. And then that's how I started DJing and got involved in music for the rest of the year. Actually, it's interesting though, because the three of you, you're more from like a law or like business. Yeah. Like all three of our families. Yeah, right? yeah, it's very, it's and you very also, strange. Did you study yeah. it or? Uh, like I studied economics, or, oh, economics for four years. Yeah. Got my bachelor and then I did a master in international business. Oh wow. Then work in startups for about four years before deciding to do this full time. Did you like that? Did you really like economics and business? Uh, economics a bit less, it's like less applied. Uh, but the business world I like because like it's you can just like think of ideas and try to implement them a little bit like we did with Kenny Ballet and BTSM. Mm -hmm. So to me that's like super fun. Was music a big part of your life, or were your parents surprised that you wanted to like quit all this business and do music? My parents, my parents didn't support it. They were uh, they were not saying anything bad about it, but it was kind of clear that they were like this is kind of weird after all these studies and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then when they saw the success and how serious we were and how organized we were, uh, they, they kind of like jumped on it and now they're proud of it. They don't ask me to change industry anymore, but <laughs> it's good. It wasn't any like bad pressure, mm -hmm. just a little additional, uh, stay organized and do what you need to do kind of mm -hmm. message. Were you guys worried of doing 
music because you probably, yeah, you already had like stable jobs right back then yeah yeah, yeah that was like our mid-20s uh well i i had like a job pat engineer was like a lawyer so you can go back to that anytime yeah <laughs> uh and patrick was like in between a few jobs mm -hmm. uh so yeah when I we did the jump, I wasn't really worried because all the guys were growing, our group was growing, we were starting to develop the right contacts. Uh, it seems like everything was going well, so why not give it a try and just and just do it? Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. How did you get your name out there initially, like after the cannibal parties? A lot, a lot, a lot of grinding. So by building a family, we were able to like leverage the success of like everyone and just like kind of like create a big family where we can keep building together uh, so it was a lot of work to like network with the right people talk with the right agent talk to bloggers talk to YouTube channels uh, on top of like a good branding and advertisement strategy mm -hmm. and just staying on top of like your art your craft making sure you show is as good as possible and the fans feel feel good about what you're doing in, the, in your direction so it's a mix of both you know there's mm -hmm. not like a secret recipe uh, if you work hard and you're consistent, at one point something good would happen. I, at least I believe that. Mm -hmm. Were you focusing, or where were early fans finding you from? Was it more from YouTube or SoundCloud, or what was it? It was very, like, first it was really like the, the Cannibalian family. So, like, the parties were so big, we were, like, we were blessed with having a few hundred, a few thousand fans in Montreal that were already kind of, like, listening to the music and getting involved in the project. And then after that, it was very web-based. So some people were curious about where we were doing from like the event side and seeing like YouTube recaps. And other were more and more interested by the music we were releasing. Uh, so it was kind of like a mix of everything. And then when we started playing a lot of shows, the show feedback was so good. So that added in like another layer of, of growth and, and yeah, and success from there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like at a certain point you were like stuck in the Montreal bubble and you were trying to break out of it or? No, not really because we, everything we were doing was to hit like the right people. So where are people listening to music? Where are they streaming it? How are they discovering music? So we always targeted at this. Montreal for us was more like of an asset oh. where it was kind of like, a, okay, we have all these fans that already know about us. It's kind of like a proof of concept. So from there, what can we do? How much more can we progress? How can we bring like our Montreal vibe and family uh, to the outside, to the US, to Europe, to Asia? Uh, so yeah, that was the mm -hmm. mindset. Did you have, or were most of the people are talking to like mentors based in Montreal, who were you asking for advice, like how to do certain things, like how do you know, because you didn't really have like many people, like, your family was in uh, positions. Yeah, so. not at all. Uh, well, I think like on one part I was working in the marketing, uh, kind of like tech world, so everything was like brand new at the early 2000s, mm -hmm. so website, social media, I was getting a lot of info from that. Oh, okay. We did a lot, a lot, a lot of research, obviously. A lot of like interviews like this where mm -hmm. we learn how uh, the manager of Justice started his parties in Paris, how Diplo started in Philadelphia, how Stevie Oki was doing stuff here in a, on the West Coast. So from there we learned a lot and we started discovering how maybe to leverage what we had built so far. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like straight mentors, there was like a few people in Montreal, talent buyers and stuff we discussed with a lot. Uh, we were really close with Jillionaire from Major Laser back then, and he gave us a few advice like staying in Montreal. Yeah, because... he performed at your parties, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was kind of like funny. We booked him, and then he was like staying at our house, like very casual. And then two years later, he's just like on top of the world, Insane. like playing in front of like 75,000 people <laughs> at like crazy festival. Or just like, well, what happened in the 24 months, Jill? But yeah, <laughs> that's life. <laughs> And what clicked to you to start the record label? Uh, the fact that we had success and a good following in Montreal. People were passionate about what we were doing in the parties and we wanted to, to display the music of the family and our music for them. So starting the label was like really kind of like a, a very important stone in the career of BTSM where like the aspiration, the work, the, the events were kind of like all fall into this label that kind of like developed and allowed like all the artists to express themselves and give them like a business platform to have at least some revenues and a structure behind their career. How many years ago was it when you first started it? The label is going to be eight years old officially oh, wow. in November uh, this year, so it's been seven years old. But at the beginning, yeah. Oh, we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah, did you have like how, yeah. <laughs> how did you figure it out, or did you have inspirations for the label? We, I like the branding side was like pretty locked on. 
uh, like all the business size we just learned on top. So one of our friends introduced us to our distribution distribution company, uh, and that was like a super easy tool to use online. So from there we were able to like start distributing the music, and then we just started grinding with the team to get contacts, email, do outreach, work with other people, and just grinding really hard for two three years until it started to get some recognition internationally uh, but it was it was fun and it was good it was always like growing every year so we when we were never, we never felt in a position of like uh, not being able to progress it felt good every year we felt we had accomplished certain of our goals so that was quite that quite cool what clicked to you that that was the right time because it's either you put your energy into the label or you could also put into your artist project uh, we were we were able to we were always able to keep the balance uh, nowadays it's harder because we tour so much yeah. and the, everything is like a bigger scope but now we have a bit bigger team so that's fun uh, we're kind of like really intense workaholic <laughs> if we need to accomplish something and we take a stance with an artist we say we're gonna deliver this by this time or do this project release your music this way we try to always honor our word and just like not cut any corners so mm -hmm. there's many nights where I skipped on a Netflix special or whatever <laughs> just to be able to like make sure everything is connecting mm -hmm. uh, but yeah how about the name how did you come up with it black tiger sex machine oh no the, your label oh the label oh that's the that's the weirdest story so the club owners came to see us at like a small bar 150 people and they're like oh you guys are good you guys are organized we want to build long term with you guys in this 700 people venue but we need to do a party in 10 days and we're like are you crazy how are we gonna do a party in 10 days like we do parties of like 150 people how are we gonna scale it to to 500 percent in 10 days so Julien Pat myself we we're discussing and we wanted to do something quite aggressive and shocking and we found the old Cannibal and Holocaust movie which is a a movie that was banned in 20 countries oh, wow. and it had like a pretty provocative uh, movie flyer so from there we decided to rip it we did some photoshop added like the the info of the event thought that it would go nowhere and it would be a one-time thing but the thing blew up i don't know how we got the right djs to play that night and the word got around montreal was dead that weekend maybe and it just blew up so from there we were kind of stuck with this word cannibalen, which means cannibalism in German. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> and then that was working super well. And we knew that like when you have something that works and you want to keep building, you got to kind of go with what works. Mm -hmm. uh, so everything was there. All the foundations of like the cannibalen brand were there through that first poster and, and the fan intensity. So we decided to go with it. Mm -hmm. And now I'm 33 and I have a record label. <laughs> yeah. Making reference to German cannibalism movie, <laughs> movies. Hey. Yeah, and then how long until um, after you guys heard it that you wanted to incorporate the masks? The mask actually came uh, three months after the record label launch. Oh, okay. So it was like, it's not something that we thought. I mean, uh, at the time, I don't think we discussed like the integration of Cannibalen and Black Tiger Sex Machine on a branding level. Uh, Julien always had like these really really big aspirations for how how the Cannibal Inn can be like an image and a vibe and the helmet was part of this and we had the discussion with with Gabriel who helped us design the first set of helmets and uh, and yeah so that came about like the same time but yeah and you've went through a few helmets since then yeah and now we're on the third generation mm -hmm. how did yeah. the how do you describe the differences in the generations? So the first one was really just a switch under the under the chin to turn the lights on and off, almost like a light switch in a house mm -hmm. uh, with uh, eight eight double A batteries. So it was just white and that's it, and it was big and and clumsy. Uh, the second one we added uh, some Wi-Fi and color and the color are color lights i mean color leds sorry mm -hmm. and the ability to control the lights but it was like some default with the the way it was designed it was still cool but it was not as slim and and tight as the current design and then the third iteration it's been like uh, 18 months now oh, nice. and it works really well there's a yeah they, they've been working pretty well mm -hmm. how would you describe how your music has changed compared to the early songs you made uh, 
At the beginning, when we started making music, there was not a whole lot of dubstep around us, so there was much more like sample based, kind of like disco house influence, old school dog sauce, and a lot of electro. The label and just our musical taste like expanded towards like more bassy stuff. Uh, so, yeah, so definitely a bit less electro house, complexro, and more kind of like all around bass mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, yeah. Last question, how have you guys grown as a trio? Oh, that's a really good question. What's really funny is we've known each other for... <laughs> uh, since kindergarten. Uh, <laughs> yeah, F you, long yeah. time. <laughs> so yeah, Pat and I since four, yeah. Julien since 12. Uh, all of us kind of like found our like forces and weakness in like Kenny Ballet and Black Tiger Sex mm -hmm. Machine. Uh, we developed a lot of skills. Obviously it's like, it's not necessarily hard. Uh, to be always touring with the same people, but uh, we managed to stick together with very minimal amount of fights. We usually always find a way to get over our challenge. Uh, yeah, when there's a problem, we talk about it, we find solution, and we've been sticking together for a long time. There's been a lot of like ups and downs, like for many of us here and there, like on various level and. We, that never really stopped us, so it's been good. I'm blessed to have two two crazy guys with me to yeah. do this adventure, and mm -hmm. it feels like a little bit surreal. We had like big goals, and we achieved like most of them, but we just want to keep going, and it, it's been like a fairy tale. So. Mm -hmm. Actually, one question that I want to add: since you guys have been around so long, how do you guys like stay current with the times, but also not like? try to stick to the trends too much. Yeah, so obviously for a lot of producers or people coming up in the industry, keeping up with trends is important. Uh, I feel like one benefit of the label for us is like, when we feel a trend is coming up or we have new tastes in music that are developing, we'll do a lot of releases in that style and that will kind of like affect how we work as BTSM. <laughs> but on the flip side for BTSM, we always felt a little bit like the odd man out, you know, <laughs> like sometimes we play bass stage with with DJs making rhythm or like super intense dubstep and we're not quite this, we've done a lot of style so over the years like our sound has been like heavy but it's been also like very broad around, around like BPM style and our fans have accepted that so for us it feels, we don't feel like if like we're changing tempo tomorrow or the next day in the next month we don't feel it's like a switch and change because we've been around for so long. We saw the first dubstep era, we saw the electro era, uh, we saw the trap era, we saw the first Moomba car, Moomba ton era, mm -hmm. and now that kind of like in, that's in between, like in between kind of like electro Chains house workers. and the temple nowadays. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we've seen a lot, but we know what we want to do the vibe, the futuristic, the energy but at the same time the mystery we want to bring to our sounds, our production and shows. So, so for us it's been pretty easy to kind of like navigate all these things. Yeah, I love I that. feel, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Our pleasure. <laughs> Shout out to LA. Yes. <laughs> and now I'm with Jillian of BTSM. How's it going? <laughs> so cute. <laughs> You're also born in, were you born in Montreal or? Yes, I was born in Montreal, Canada, so therefore I speak French. Bonjour, à tous mes amis qui parlent français. Yeah, we're from, uh, we're all from Quebec. Um, mm -hmm. Some of my family's from Quebec City and Three Rivers, like uh, Three Rivers is a smaller town and Quebec City is kind of like the second biggest city in, in uh, Montreal, uh, not in Montreal, sorry, in Quebec. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I was born in Montreal, so really proud, it's, mm -hmm. it's a great city. Did you have a musical upbringing or? Uh, so, r when I was much younger, I played the uh, piano a little bit, you know, learned how to read music and stuff like that. But uh, I was more into uh, movies, actually. Oh! Yeah. I started, like, acting a little bit and started getting, like, acting coaches in Montreal. What age was this around? Um, you know, I started getting really interested about it around 15 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm a big movie buff, so... I started realizing that at first I was like, okay, maybe I want to be in front of the camera. And now I'm starting to think like, I do some of our music videos and I'm, I'm really involved in the process of everything that's visual. So I'm thinking I want to be more behind the camera a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Well, not on social media because people that follow <laughs> us, they know I'm, I'm a lot in front of the camera, but I just love everything about, you know, uh, filming and being filmed. I think it's a very unique way of expressing yourself. So. Uh, I'd say I was more, I was more like doing that. 
Mm-hmm. And, was it uh, from your parents, or what were what were they? Yeah, was? like my my dad's like my dad loves music, and uh, you know he loves mu- movies. So when we were going to school, like every morning, he he would bring me to school, and he would just like tell me about a different movie. Oh, wow. And to me, it was like I was brought in brought up in, in a family where. I, like my dad didn't have like parents so growing up I, I would say like all the important like moments in my life uh, like you know birthdays or Christmas or stuff like that it was always a little bit cold like my parents are very loving but mm-hmm. the emotions they would come out more when we were watch, watching movies mm. so I was starting to use movies more to like teach myself how to react to things. Oh, that's that interesting. Yeah. What and, were your favorite movies back then? Oh, wow. I don't think... Like, they're really obscure movies, but I'm a huge fan of Alejandro Jodorowsky. Mm-hmm. So he made movies like El Topo, uh, La Montaña Sacra. It's like very strange movies, but the the photography is amazing. Uh, and he's a genius. Like, he's a real genius. He still makes stuff. He's There's actually a documentary on, on him trying to make the movie Dune. Uh, it's called Dune's, uh, Jodorowsky's Dune, and he, he actually lost the project, but most of the stuff he wrote down for the project was used afterwards for like movies like Alien, oh, wow. you know, a, a big inspiration in Hollywood, but he was, he was never like on the, uh, he was never behind the camera for a big, big production, but he made all these like obscure mu- movies. I also love uh, a lot of sci-fi stuff like Blade Runner, for me is a great inspiration and I think uh, people that follow us they know that it has a connection with everything we do Mm -hmm. Um, and also some simpler stuff like Ordinary People, Harold and Maude um, from Al Ashby being there but there's so many you know Mm -hmm. it really depends I'm interested in like French movies, North American movies, cinema noir like all these like obscure movies from the 70s I just think like there's an answer to every question you have there's an answer in movies so I would just like dig out and I, I worked actually in a store like a that when when like blockbusters were mm-hmm. we, I had I was working in something that was a little bit more uh, refined than blockbuster and, and people would just you know ask us what we liked and I would recommend movies and that was my kick mm-hmm. actually but, how did music become more bigger and bigger part of your life well to, to be honest I think like when you're when you're inspired and when you like art in general I feel personally that music is going to be there I don't like I'm in my head a painter listens to music movies are filled with connections with uh, music but you know I wanted to go to a university in in movies in movie directing Mm -hmm. but my dad was like no you're going to law school (laughs) so you know I'm sure some of you guys have parents that (laughs) a little bit harder with with school and I was like okay I'll I'll do this and then I'll figure out what I want to do afterwards so I went to law school but while I was in law school that's when I started discovering more about electronic music and I was like what is this stuff you know uh, I went to this justice show with Pat and Mark was DJing but he was at another university and I went to it had to, to see justice and I saw like the crust light up like at the beginning of the show I'm like what is this mm-hmm. I and, and I knew I was like this is what I'm doing with my life so I think it's this connection with like visual incorporation the music the lighting all of that is what like really triggers me and I think like people that come see us play they see that in our shows with the helmets the visuals the post-apocalyptic uh, you know vibe and experience it's more like an experience so it's a movie how did you brainstorm that at the beginning like with the name did you have like a it's like a plan of how you guys were going to do branding for the onset or how was it uh the, like the name came out of nowhere it's like kind of a weird story it's just like there's the r-rated version and the, the pg-13 version but mm-hmm. it's just like this girl that was texting me and I'm not super proud of the story, but I, I was trying to get her to, to stop up, texting right? me for real. <laughs> and the guy next to me, like I was finishing bar school, which is like the after law school when mm-hmm. you're before you do your internship and articling. And the guy next to me is like, yo, dude, just text her whatever 
random words you want and she'll stop dex texting you. So I started texting her Black Tiger Sex Machine. <laughs> and I don't know why we were playing soccer that night, Pat, Mark, and myself, and I'm like, dudes, like this name, for some reason, it sounds good, Black Tiger Sex Machine. But believe it or not, there was actually zero plan of having helmets, zero plan of branding or whatever. It was just like a name that we were looking for a name for so long. And we're like, this stands out. It feels good. It might feel a little funny at the beginning for some people, but after a while, like saying it over and over, like Black Tiger Sex Machine, it sounds cool. You yeah. never forget it. And then there was, we didn't even think of like doing BTSM. That came afterwards, you know? Yeah. So it's kind of, yeah, it's, there's luck around these little moments, I feel. So how long after until you started thinking more about the branding? Well, we tried a couple of things. At first we were like DJing some small parties. We were doing like mostly house music. We were like, you know, ripping some samples from old like Motown tracks. And, you know, we were playing around just trying to make something happen. And we were, uh, we were getting some cool little bookings and smaller venues in Montreal, but we had no bigger plan because we were all fin finishing university. And uh, so when I finished law school, uh, I went to, to, to do bar school. I did my art to I'm like, I'm gonna finish all of that. But the night that I got an offer to keep working as a lawyer, I was like, nah, it's not for me, you know? I'm still a lawyer officially because I pay my fees. I don't want to lose that title. It's oh, wow. still it's still something important to me, but I, you know, I felt like I needed to do something more. So that, at that point, I'd say around 2010, I was like, okay, what can we do with this name? How can we transform this and turn it into something bigger? And we started these events called Cannibalen in Montreal. And um, it just felt right to go into like this harder style of music. So that's where the helmet idea started popping in my head. And um, you know, I, yeah, in general, all these ideas came around when I had more time to, to give to that project around 2010. Mm -hmm. And then how did you come up with the church community? So that also to me is kind of a, it's kind of a lucky story, you know, there's no, I wasn't planning of, on creating this BTSM church idea, but uh, we were opening, like that's the way back, but we were opening for Sebastian Ingrosso in my church. <laughs> Doesn't really make sense, but it made sense at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, back then we had all of our CDs and everything we wanted to hand him out. A CD and uh, we how many years ago was this? That's probably like wow, like seven <laughs> or six years ago, something like that. I uh, probably Lloyd, I'd say six years ago. Okay. Kind of. A lot can change in six yeah. years. That's that's like the you guys need to realize a lot can change in six years. If you work, a lot can change. But we were like in the green room we asked if we could be in the green room that's how you know we were just starting and i went up to him and i'm like look we have this uh, promo video that we made we filmed it inside a church mm. and that was like i directed that with uh, karel schladeg that does all of our photos and videos now and we we were making a lot of projects together and, and i just like I th he, he looks at me, literally he's like super, super cold look and he's like, why inside a church? <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, it's this idea of community. People, to me, electronic music is this kind of collective of people going to like the, the midnight mass, you know, it's a <laughs> ceremony. And he's like, that's a great answer. You know? so, and then the idea stuck with me. I'm like, so what we do, what we have is a church, this post-apocalyptic church and the BTSM church thing just kind of came naturally. So it just sounds good. So we started using it. Mm -hmm. And have you ever done this type of marketing before? Has it all come to you? Was it, th but it's all through the movies, right? Because you have like chapters and yeah. everything. I was really obsessed when I was younger. It's very weird because my dad's a doctor, my mom's a nurse, my sister's a doctor. Oh, wow. You know, it's, it's in my family, it's more about uh, performance and profession. And I'm super grateful to have them around me because they're very inspiring and they love their jobs. But to me, there was something always like missing, you know? So I was traveling a lot, backpacking. I was a real hippie, I had dreads. And, <laughs> <laughs> but I was looking for an answer. And I'd say like, I don't know, it, it's hard to say, but 
movies were a part of it for sure. Um, I think like traveling, a lot of uh, a lot of answers started coming to me. You know, like when I was going uh, um, from one city to another, I was meeting people, and I think like meeting people, listening to music, uh, just art in general, something was coming to me. But before that, and that's the really weird part about me, I was collecting like folk magazines. Oh. I loved how people were putting down fashion into like a one page idea, with, even with the text. And I was fascinated on how like simple and well those pages were built. And I was just like trying to figure out how to use this and use it into social media, you know, push it into social media. And to me, social media, the first rule is like, when you're selling something to somebody, because we're all selling something on social media, but you have to be real. You have to connect with people on something kind of organic so then you can push further. And I didn't like getting, getting um, art, like having artists selling me stuff in my feed, like listen to this, you know, like a kind yeah. of a, it's almost like I have to work, you know, because they're telling me do this, oh, it's important. Yeah. So I was more into the idea of like building a community. So investing money into growing our network so people would come to our shows and discover us and meet us. And if you know like our band, you, you know that we take the time to meet our fans. So I think social media to me, it was a connection between what I really loved and wanted to show to people from like movies to music to art in general and even traveling. I wanted to show all of that to people, package it well. That's what we have with our band. And then I also wanted them to, uh, you know, receive it organically, if that makes sense. I wanted them to want to come to a show. I don't want to force them to come to a show. And I think that's what's happening now. Our show is more of an experience, so I don't have to push as much as I needed to before. But I actually have a, a funny story about mm. marketing. This week I was going up to our offices in Montreal and I was inside the elevator and somebody had put like flyers near the, the buttons, you know? Okay. And it's such a strange place to yeah. put a flyer. But it was a flyer about a sale that was happening inside the building. Oh, that's so smart. <laughs> to me, you know, I make connections right away. I'm like, that person found a very interesting place that's yeah. a little bit like kind of aggressive because yeah. it's near the buttons. But at the same time, they're they're not forcing us mm -hmm. they're, they're just pushing this yeah. idea that if you want to go to the sale it's in the building so to me that's how I've always connected with social media I think it's just a fascinating way to present a product to people and then if they want it they can go and get it but no I've never like read anything about marketing it just kind of came naturally to me I learned about the algorithms of every social media platform I just mm -hmm. took like everything in <laughs> it just came naturally it's well, strange what would you say have been your biggest challenges so far your group uh, it's the biggest challenge and the biggest strength you know we're three in the mm. band so it's a it's a group so you have to work with other people which is in every you know people have families so they know it's we are always together but it's also our biggest strength because we complete each other perfectly we've known each other forever so it's it's just like kind of a challenge because you want to you want to make sure that like you're you're well represented inside a group and I think the others want that too but at some point you need to realize you're not alone you're three which is a challenge in every group and I'm sure that's why a lot of group kind of like disappear at some yeah. point but we are super close so now now more than forever I think that's more of a kind of abstract challenge because now I think it's just a strength but mm -hmm. the other challenge for us was really just finding an agent oh, that was probably the biggest ever. like when you're Canadian you want to come to the States you need you need a P2 visa and it sounds easy but I'm telling you it's a it's a world of pain oh, when you're trying to you, you want to you have to sell your product to agencies and it, it took time Mm -hmm. Every morning I was waking up, I was just waiting for somebody to say like, okay, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna represent you in the States. You can come 
we'll see if you guys can sell tickets. Because we knew we could do it. I was always saying, give us 15 minutes on any stage in the US and it's gonna start. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was probably the biggest challenge. <laughs> Last question. What do you guys want to be remembered for? Ooh, wow. I think uh I think the love and support that the full BTSM Church community has, be like, has between uh, each and every one, mm. like, the love that comes from every member, to me, this type of thing where people meet, like, the lover of their life, or they meet somebody that helps them, or they actually can just talk to us or talk to other uh, fans, and they feel good. I think, like, the positivity that we push outside of just you know because our branding is is darker the music is yeah. dark the the show is has this darker post apocalyptic, post apocalyptic atmosphere but i really feel that the positivity it, around like everything we do is what's most important right now yeah i love this thank you so much <laughs> my pleasure thanks for having me bye